Welcome to Redbeard Radio. I'm Brian Keith. And everyone listening to this, if you want to grow your business, you at some point, either in the past or the future, you're going to hit a time where you need to move from doing everything yourself to having other people do things. And like everyone, you're going to start off with something easy that you're going to outsource to a team or you're going to find someone on Upwork, something like that. But at some point, you're going to take some idea that is really important that you really want to do yourself, but you have to give it to somebody else because you don't have enough hours in the day. And whether you succeed or fail on the first day, you have to hand off something important will depend in large part on the systems and the processes that you've built around that transition from being you making the important decisions to your team helping out on those important decisions to walk you through this critical crux of your business. We have automation expert, Jamie Gilliland. Jamie, welcome to Red Beard Radio. Thank you, Brian. I love it. I'm uh, excited because everybody hits that wall. And it's so important to know what is going on instead of just hiring. I've seen so many people just say, oh, you're a keep expert or you're an automation expert or you're an active campaign expert. Great, you're hired. And then they don't really know what's going on. So I love that you're helping people to understand that ahead of time so they can hire properly. Well, let's look into a common use case where people try to outsource a decision, but they don't outsource it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is our first mistake? Let's assume that we found someone who is a generally competent person and we've given them a task and they fail at it. Either the quality is too low or it's behind schedule or they deliver the wrong thing. How do we start in understanding what went wrong? <laughs> well, I have a personal nightmare myself um, that I did years ago. You know, um, typically when we hire, we're looking for certain qualities, certain skill sets. And those are easy to find. And I say that kind of with air quotes around it because it's only as good as what the person is telling you their skill sets are. Hmm. There's no guarantee or verification or validation that they have those skill sets. So years ago, when my agency was growing, I did a lot of web design work and I was really good at selling. And then as a single entrepreneur, I would sell and then the next month I would fulfill. So that standard roller coaster, sell one month, fulfill the next. And your revenue was up and down and up and down and up and down. So I decided, well, I just need web designers. That's easy enough. I'll go higher. So I did. I grew the business, went from 60000 a year to 60000 a month, literally 12x to my company. And I just kept throwing bodies at it. I had 20 web designers. Nice. Turns out being a web designer wasn't the only thing that I needed them to know and understand. I needed them to know and understand what I was selling, what I was delivering, what I as a owner of the company felt the right way to do things was. And I hadn't set those systems up. Hmm. And unfortunately, I ended up imploding at the time. So I literally stopped business for six months. And I personally, even though I already paid a web designer to do it, I personally went back and took care of each site, each client to make sure they were getting what I presented, what I thought was right. So the same thing happens if you don't have your own systems in place, if you don't if you haven't done it first, or at least thought through the process, A to B to C to D, they don't, they're, they're going to take the quick, here's how I do it, which may not be the way you want it done. And when we talk about automation, it is critical for believability and for deliverability that your voice, your message, your systems are involved, not just a mechanical robot. This is the way it's done. Well, let's take a simple task, relatively simple, and let's find out the Jamie approach to what are all the systems that you actually need. So let's say here's the task. Write a three email 
uh, campaign in keep for when people first opt into anything that introduces them to who I am. Let's call it a meet Brian campaign. It's using Greg Jenkins language. What systems besides the obvious, the obvious is, well, there needs to be email content. It needs to go into keep. What systems are we not seeing in that really simple description that we need to have locked down and really solid before this can be successful? Sure. So the first thing is the content, having your voice, your message in the content so that it's truly meet Brian, not generic, that it's Brian's words that we're using. That's the first thing I want to make sure. The second is what are we offering? In addition to meeting Brian, are we offering a chance to talk to Brian? Are we offering a free PDF of some sort, a video, a course? What is the action we want them to take once they meet who Brian is? And then how are we handling that action? So for instance, if we want them to click on a video to watch a video, and once they watch that video, we don't want them to get the next email because it's telling them again to do the video. We want to make sure all of those pieces and the journey What are the different forks in the road that they can take? We want to make sure we know and understand what those are before somebody starts building it. That's a lot of good stuff. Uh, I want to dig into the first one. You said content. What are, what's the best way you found to get content out of someone's head when you want to put it into a simple email series like this? Sure. So I usually sit down, actually, I usually have my husband sit down because he's the copywriter. But um, he sits and asks a lot of questions, first of all, gets people talking to him just and they might be simple questions like, tell me about your last whatever, last vacation, Hmm. so that he starts to hear what are the words, what are the things that people are using in the process? You know, tell me about the last time you met a new customer. What how did you introduce yourself? What you know, are you as we work with a lot of speakers, authors, coaches. So we'll listen to them on stage or um, podcasts they've been on or different places where they're just talking about themselves so that you can pick up their actual voice. You know, if somebody typically says, hey, y'all versus hi, this is Jamie, then we want to pick up the hey, y'all. Mm hmm. My favorite thing is I love interviewing people, but I record everything and then I just get a transcript. Exactly. And then I start hacking apart the transcript. Yeah. Uh, and I might I might take out, you know, let's say it's a, a five thousand word transcript. I might keep a thousand words of, you know, cut it down to the fifteen hundred words that are really the guts of the thing. The relevance. Get rid of another third of those, add on twenty percent to sort of fill things using their language, but then still have the end product be substantially similar. But here's the thing, Jamie, how do you tell if someone has the ability to do that? Because that kind of judgment's hard. Summarizing judgment is hard. Saying summarize this 5,000 word thing into 1,000 word, that's hard. But then make it sound as if it was written the exact length that the ending product is. That is a different skill set. And it is also hard. How do you assess if people have the ability before you give them the task? I would ask for examples of their writing and see what they were. And the one thing that I would pick up on is, do they all sound the same? Because they're different people, they're different examples. They should not sound anything like one another. Mm. They should sound like the original person you were writing for. Mm -hmm. That's great. Let's talk about offer was the second thing you mentioned. When you're talking about systems around offers, what's a standard kind of system you might have for a simple campaign? Sure. It could be that they clicked a link. And once they click that link, then we may want to follow up and say, hey, now that you watch this video, blah, blah, blah. Or if they made a purchase, we don't want to keep bothering. Why didn't you buy? Why didn't you buy? Why didn't you buy? When they've already done it, there's nothing more embarrassing or infuriating for the person that actually paid you money. So making sure that we know what the steps are and when they take a step, when they don't take a step, how do we remind them gently? When they do take the step, what's the next step after that? Because typically there's, I call it the journey. There's there's a path that we want to take them on. They watch this video, then they download this free thing. Then we offer them a low price product. Then we offer them a coaching call. 
And from the coaching call, we upsell them into a high ticket offer, whatever, whatever the process is that you've outlined. We want to make sure we know that before anything starts getting written or built. What percentage of these systems do you use verbatim from client to client versus cut you customize for each client based on their own needs? Hmm. Typically, the functionality of the product is very similar in different clients that I work with, but the content is completely customized. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then there's usually some twist of some sort, but it's typically a free product to a low price product to a coaching call to a high paid product. That's in the speaker, author, coach world. That's the typical process. Um, so percentage wise, probably 80%. When you think about all the systems of your clients, which ones do new clients most often not have that makes the biggest impact for them? Uh, the follow-up nurture. I had a client come to me one time, brand new client. He was all excited. I have 30,000 people on my list. And I said, great. When did you email them last? And you could hear the crickets chirping. Uh -huh. And so many people build the list. They get them on the list and then they don't do anything with them. I had another client that had 50,000 people. They emailed irregularly, but at least once a month. And we sent out a brief email that said, how can I help you grow faster? How can I help you move faster? We sent it to 50 people on their list. They closed $50,000 with that one simple little email. And we said, see now, if you send an email like this once a week, the difference that you can make because you're communicating with them. That's how I grew my business from how I 12 x it in a year. Um, just communicating and educating my clients in the process of what I was doing and how I was doing it. Um, 12 times what I did the year before because I kept in touch with them. And that's the biggest piece I see people missing. They just, they, they send a sell email, sell, sell, but they only send them when they're launching something once a year or when they're launching something once a quarter. It's, it's not enough. It's what have you done for me lately? Yeah. So having, you know, I have clients that send six to 10 emails a day, which I think is too much, but if, but it works, works for him. <laughs> but, um, well, let me ask you this. What's your favorite system for creating content? A lot of folks have a great long-term nurture for a while and then life gets in the way. They stop creating new stuff. And if it's dependent upon the owner to be creating new content, it eventually just sort of gets swept under the rug. I'll deal with yeah. it later. What's your favorite way to go systematize that originality? So I don't know that you have to keep it original all the time. If I send you an email today and I send it to you again six months from now, I guarantee you probably don't remember that I sent it to you six months ago. Hmm. So if somebody can come up with enough content to fill six months, which is what, 24 emails once a week, mm -hmm. you know, minimum. If we can come up with 24 weeks of content, we can put it on repeat after that, as long as there's some educational value and there's some offering. And then as new stuff comes up, you can add to it. But getting that base six months works pretty darn well. Okay. So folks, if you've listened to this and you thought, wow, there are some systems that I could have more fleshed out, but I don't have the energy or the knowledge on how to do them and you want to talk to Jamie, Jamie, how can people get on your calendar for an assessment? Sure. I have meet with Jamie G, J A M I E G dot com. And I have a 15 minute get to know you and a 30 minute actually. So they can pick either one of those and I'd be happy to chat. Wonderful. And Jamie, where's the best place for people to follow you on social media? Uh, probably Facebook. That's where I do most of what I'm doing these days. I'm about to launch some Instagram stuff, uh, but currently it would be Facebook. Wonderful. And what's your Facebook name there? Jamie High Gilliland. 
Fantastic. Jamie, thank you for being on Redbeard Radio. Thank you.